has been says to the first of, as Terry Pratchett might say, a trilogy in four parts on borehole design. Um, my subtitle for today is why 656 metres does not equal 656 metres. Now that's the actual number uh, of the, the total bowl requirement for a real project that I'm going to use as an example in a moment. But unfortunately I found when I was pulling the presentation together that 656 is a number that messes with both my accent and my dyslexia. And so if I say anything between 555 and 666, please bear with me, I can't help it, it's just the way things are. So without further ado, I'll just talk you through what I'm going to talk about. So the subtitle, why 656 does not equal 656 metres. I'm then going to go on and talk about what's important in borehole designs and what we can adjust. So what are the parameters we've got to play with when we get into borehole design. And I should just mention that most of what I'm going to talk about today, indeed most of what we're going to talk about throughout this series of discussions on borehole design, are applicable to horizontal trenches and in some aspects other types of systems like open loop as well. So just bear that in mind. And then finally I'm going to talk about the limitations and the compromises associated with the MCS lookup tables. And I think it's very important for everybody who uses those tables for design to really understand where the tables came from and what their limitations are. As Bean said, we'd really like you to post your questions in the chat. Bean will be keeping an eye on the chat. So if you do see something coming up in that, which you think, oh, that's a really good question, please do say so. Just say you'd like to hear that uh, answered and we'll just try and prioritise it towards the end. I think today's presentation may be slightly shorter than uh, previous weeks, uh, so we've got a little bit more time for questions today than perhaps we have in the last four presentations. So on with it. Why does 656 metres not equal 656 metres? Well, the ground loop design software allows us an enormous amount of control over all the aspects of the design. And it's not just the obvious ones like ground temperature and thermal conductivity, which you've got control over when you're dealing with the MCS tables. There's a huge list. And in actual fact, most of these are not just a single parameter, or many of these are not just a single parameter, they're actually a number of parameters. So we can adjust the thermal diffusivity, which is analogous to conductivity, but it's how quickly temperature differences propagate throughout the ground. Put another way, it's how much interference you get between boreholes. And it's a really core parameter in ground loop design that you just do not have control over in the MCS tables. We also have control over design life. So the MCS requirement is for 20 years design life. But many commercial buildings, we put that up to 100 years because that's what the, the customer wants. So we've, again, we've got control over those parameters. We can actually adjust the temperature changes that we allow. So again, the MCS minimum requirement for returning water temperature from the ground is zero degrees. That's a pretty arbitrary number and it was just put in there. So we've got a baseline against which we can work. For schemes that MCS doesn't apply to, we can perfectly legitimately drop that ground loop temperature down to minus four, minus five, and still maintain a sustainable system in the long term. Equally, if we've got a heating and cooling system, we could actually manage that ground loop temperature up to improve both uh, the heating efficiency and the cooling efficiency. Fluid properties are really important, and it's not just the type of fluid, it's a concentration of fluid, uh, and the, the thermal properties that that gives it, so the density and the specific heat capacity, we can control all of those for different densities and requirements of fluid. Not all heat pumps are the same, so we can actually adjust the flow rates in the ground loop, which is obviously well beyond the capabilities of the tables. Further, we can start to mess around with the U-tubes. We can think about 32 mil U-tubes, 40 mil, 45 mil U-tubes, how those U-tubes sit within the borehole, and indeed the borehole diameter itself. The grout properties are a part of the industry which is poorly understood by many people who are really working in the industry. So the different mixes of grout have got significantly different thermal properties and do significantly affect the design. 
hydraulic configuration will be touched on, in fact, covered in detail in the next session by Robin Curtis when he talks about the hydraulics of ground loops. Uh, it's a, a very interesting topic, so I really urge you to uh, get involved in that webinar. But today I'm actually going to use borehole layout and specifically plotted irregular layouts as an example for how we're going to, how, how a system of, which is specified at 656 metres, ended up with something different. At this point, if I was face to face, I'd be looking for audience interaction and asking for questions, but I'll just take it on faith that you're all uh, carrying on and interested in typing loads of questions in the chat head. Key point here is all of these parameters make a difference. None of these are insignificant in ground loop design, and we only really have control of two of them in the MCS tables. So this is an example of a real project. I've anonymized it for obvious reasons. And we went to quite a lot of lengths to identify positions that were suitable for drilling in, because this is an arboretum. It's got specimen trees around the place. Uh, and the gardener wanted to make absolutely certain that we weren't going to do any damage while we were in there with our drill rig. So we identified five locations. You can see one, two, three, four, five. And when we actually run the, uh, run the loads, we found that we could get rid of this, this borehole location number two, because if we drilled to 164 meters, then those four boreholes were okay for the design. I'm not really gonna talk a lot about geology here uh, today, because it's probably a separate talk for a separate se uh, seminar, but suffice it to say, our desktop analysis showed that drilling to 164 meters was perfectly feasible in that location and yielded the best balance of borehole number against borehole depth. A few weeks went by after we issued the design and we got the call from site and from the driller and said, well, your report said five, 656 meters, there it goes, and that's what we installed me. But unfortunately, because they didn't want to drill as deep as 164 meters, this is what they installed. So this is a charming sketch that typically you get back from site with the different borehole depths. So there's a few challenges with this. First of all, we've got an awful lot more pipe in a lot less ground than we had before. So it's gonna be less efficient and I'll show you exactly why that's the case in just a second. Secondly, the boreholes aren't the same depth. So we're gonna have more challenges balancing this, this up at the manifold than we would ideally have. So to show you the impact of this on the actual design, this is a thing called the GMAP function. Now a GMAP function is simply to show you how hard each borehole is being asked to work, or perhaps more accurately, how much contribution each borehole is making to the scheme. So this is the original design, and that line of three boreholes we had along the uh, left-hand edge as we looked at it, you can see that the peak on that borehole there in the middle is slightly higher. So that borehole is contributing a little bit less, or put another way, working a little bit harder. But it's still a good design because these peaks are all relatively closely, uh, uh, relatively close in terms of height with each other. And there's no real big influence between the boreholes because we've got some nice spacing there. So to answer the question, what does 656 meters actually equal? Well, I'm afraid it equals 768 meters. And this is a GMAP function for what was installed. So you can actually see that the boreholes in the middle here have got significantly different heights in their GMAP from the boreholes in the side. So these fellas in the middle are contributing less to the overall design, hence the requirement for that extra amount of borehole. Now to put financial numbers on this, it's over six grand's worth of drilling to actually install that additional, um, additional pipe in the ground. So it's, it's quite a big impact in the project costs. So what's important and what can we adjust? Well, key point is it's all important. All of those parameters are important. The good thing is we can adjust anything. We can absolutely adjust anything in that design, but we've got to be con very aware that all of these adjustments have consequences. And some of them may actually impact the project economics to the extent where the project may become unviable. So it goes without saying that we want to do as much of this work up front as we possibly can, but equally, we've got to react to the conditions we find in the ground. We cannot fight the geology. 
or at least if you do try and fight the geology, you're probably going to lose. So we do have to redesign. Just finally, in terms of the presentation itself, I'm going to talk for a few moments about the MCS tables. So I was involved, uh, and Robin, who's uh, going to host next week's talk, was also involved. In fact, he was, he was originally involved, and I came in later, in the construction of the MCS tables for boreholes and for horizontal systems. Now, what you've got to understand is that those tables were generated originally, not actually as a design tool, but to allow an assessment as to see whether a ground loop was even reasonable. And the idea was that the off-gem assessors would have these tables to hand. They'd be able to look at an RHI application and say, well, you've got nowhere near enough ground loop there, so we're not going to credit your scheme. So that was the intent of the, 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 the tables in the first place. But they are now being used for design. So if you are using them for design, just a few words. First of all, read and stick to the small print at the top. It is really important. All of those those parameters that I mentioned a couple of slides ago that are available to us to adjust in the uh, ground loop design software are captured in those small print at the top uh, right hand corner of the MCS tables. So it is really, really important that you do stick to those parameters in there. Secondly, don't, and I really mean don't, use the tables inappropriately. And the two most common inappropriate uses I see of the tables are building type and size and conductivity. So the tables are actually designed and we're working on amendments to the regulations at the moment that they are actually designed for 30 kilowatt houses and below. Houses only and 30 kilowatts maximum. In actual fact there's a lot of discussion at the moment should we reduce that to single heat pump in a house? Is that the right thing to do? If you are using it for a police station, for a hospital, for a school, or a house above 30 kilowatts, that is actually inappropriate use of those tables. So be aware of what's going on and the potential consequences. The second most common thing I see, and perhaps even more common, is an unrealistic assessment of the conductivity of the ground that we're going to encounter. Now, I feel really sorry for the poor ladder lass in the office at the installer, whose job it is to put the numbers through the MCS tables or a spreadsheet that's been developed from those tables. And you can just imagine a big bad sales director coming along and leaning, putting pressure on them to say, well, why can't you use 3.0 watts per meter per Kelvin instead of 2.3 for sandstone? If you're gonna do that, you've gotta be aware of the consequences of what could potentially happen. And it's very, very difficult, I think, for what is very often a very junior person in the office to push back on that. Next point I'd make is just recognize that the tables are inherently compromised. And that was to allow them to be fitted into as broad a range of projects as possible. The obvious example is that if you look at borehole spacing in the MCS tables, it says six meters minimum spacing. Now actually, if you design these things every day as I do, you'll recognize that six meters spacing on a borehole system, if it's heating only, is a very short spacing, it's a very narrow spacing. Different if you're heating and cooling when some energy is going back in, but more commonly when we're looking at heating only projects, we're trying to get up to 10, 12, 14 meter spacing to minimize the amount of borehole overall. So there are significant compromises in the MCS tables to allow them to be as universally applicable as possible, and you've got to be aware of that. A side point, and John Findlay in the third of these borehole uh, discussions we'll talk about, is the tables will not warn you of a geological problem, a geological hazard. What you're talking about, mainly groundwater coming to the surface, those kinds of things. Are there coal mines beneath the site? Are those coal mines uh, potentially liable to spontaneous combustion? The, the tables tell you nothing about that. So you've got to be aware of what you're doing from a drilling point of view in any areas where you've got potential groundwater concerns, coal mines, other concerns like unexploded ordnance and so on. The tables will tell you nothing about that. And then finally, you've got to recognize that the cost of getting a professional like myself or the other consulting members in the Ground Source Heat Pump Association to give you a professionally done and warranted design is very often significantly less than the cost savings you get because you need less borehole in the project. So it's really important to understand that 
And also make sure if you are designing systems according to the MCS tables, does your PI cover cover you in doing that? And so that's two very important points. And the second part of that is I very often say to clients, in most instances, when you come to us for a borehole design and you've done your original estimates using the MCS tables, 90% of the time, I'm gonna give you good news. I'm gonna say, you actually need less borehole than you're estimating here and you're gonna save significant money. 10% of the time, you might think I'm giving you bad news, but in actual fact, I'm saving you from a problem installation by saying, actually, you need a bit more borehole than you perhaps needed, you thought here. So put in a bit more and you're saving yourself from a problem installation. And that's when the really big savings can actually come into seeking professional design. So that's the formal part of the presentation. Bain, how are we looking for questions? You're muted, Bain. Bain, you're muted, yeah. Here we are. Hey! <laughs> Sorry about that, everyone. Um, uh, Chris, thank you very much indeed. I think there are some, some really important base information in that piece. Um, and um, it's reflected very much in the work that we currently as an association do um, with uh, both, uh, well, originally with, with certification bodies, but now with MCS directly looking at sites that aren't functioning as they should. So really, really important that, um, uh, that those, uh, you know, those guidelines that Chris was highlighting there are followed. Um, yes, Chris, we have got some questions. Um, uh, some of them uh, interestingly, interestingly technical, which I'm sure you'll be very happy to, to take on. So uh, apologies for the pronunciation, um, Gulkan. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, Gulkan says, uh, what is the typical depth range for boreholes and what's the minimum distance required between them? And then he's followed that up with a secondary, which says, are direct expansion systems also covered in the design software? And are these systems applicable in the UK? Okay, um, let's deal with the depth range then. So the depth of the installation is driven by the geology, which we assess on the desktop, and also the capability of the driller. So different drill rigs have different capabilities in terms of depth. And then also we have uh, considerations from the hydraulics. Uh, so what diameter of pipe we need to use. Now, as I said earlier, Robin will be touching on the hydraulics in, in detail at the next session. So I don't want to steal his thunder, but generally speaking, 32 millimeter pipe is capable of doing boreholes up to 100 meters deep. 40 millimeter pipe is capable of something like 200 to 240 meters deep. But most of the time when you're beyond 200 meters, you are, or even approaching 200 meters, you're often looking at 45 mil pipe. Most of the depths in the UK are limited to about 240 metres. We're actually interested as to why that is the case. Um, there are some traditions in the marketplace and there's some R&D going on about can we actually drill safely deeper in the UK at the moment as they commonly do in, for example, Switzerland and Sweden. So many installations are limited to about 100 metres. We are often drilling and are mostly uh, specifying systems around 200 metres. But when we are in a congested site, we can go as deep as 240 metres. Um, on to what the, the second half is the spacing. Um, whilst six metres is the minimum spacing in the MCS tables, as I said in the discussion, that is actually a relatively short spacing for a heating only system. So if you can spread it out more, then you will get less, a significantly less amount of borehole requirement, which can reduce your cost. But bear in mind, you do have some knock-on costs in terms of additional header pipes to consider as part of that. When you're talking about heating and cooling systems, when you're putting heat back into the ground, then you can actually pack those pipes together much more, those worlds together much more. So I've even installed down to three, three and a half meters when we're talking about energy pile systems, for example, when we're using pipes in the piles of building. But you've got to take account of that in the duty that those pipes are gonna deliver you. So pipes at three meter spacing are not gonna give you as much output over their lifetime as a, a pipe spread out at 12, 15 meters apart. Direct expansion systems, uh, the design software I use doesn't de design direct expansion systems. Um, 
most direct expansion systems, and correct me if I'm wrong, anybody who knows better than me, but most direct expansion systems are, in, are designed by manufacturers own software. Um, there are a very small number of them in the UK, and there are some quite strict guidelines from the Environment Agency as to what you can and can't put into those ground loops. The main concern not being the refrigerant gas, but the lubricant that's required to lubricate the compressor is very often then found at the bottom of the bottle. So if there were to be a leak, then uh, that is a challenge. So whilst I'm not an expert in direct expansion systems, uh, I would just say that there are considerations there that are needed that, are, that go beyond just the water-based closed loop or propylene glycol, ethylene glycol-based closed loop systems we use. <coughs> How's that been? No, I think that's uh, I think that's fine, Chris. The, the the other thing I would just say about drilling boreholes very uh, relatively closely together is that depending on the depth and the type of geology, uh, it, it's likely that the uh, the drill bit could be directed off the vertical, uh, and uh, it's not been unknown for boreholes to actually cut through each other uh, if the spacing is inappropriate. So. Um, so that's just a, a physical thing to think about. Um, yeah, we've got more uh, more questions for you, Chris. Um, one from um, uh, Rob Rob Carter. Uh, why should you not use the MCS tables for hospitals, etc., if the operational hours are the same? Um, because the load profiles for, for that were assumed in the creation of the MCS tables were for domestic <laughs> systems, and the load profiles, oh, which are so. The minimum requirement under international standards for borehole design is to use monthly heat losses. And we use monthly heat losses to develop the MCS tables. We use domestic profiles for those, and they are completely different to the profiles you'll see in something like a hospital. Okay, good, very straightforward. Um, one here from uh, Faisal. Uh, do you have experience, and actually there's, there's a couple of questions that sort of linked, Chris, so I might give both questions and you can perhaps consider them together. So Fidel says, do you have experience with hybrid ground source and solar thermal and the impact that this has on borehole design? And then uh, related to that from Dan Large, what's the experience with PVT panels integrated with the ground collector? Um, so they're obviously directly related. Effectively, it's both about solar recharge. Fantastic questions. Um, thank you. Um, one of my specialist subjects over the years has been hybridising ground source and solar hybridising with ground source is a very interesting topic. In fact, we've installed a few systems. It seems to work very nicely in the social housing market uh, place. There's a, a lot of benefits to it. So. There are several different ways you can hybridize ground source with solar and solar PVT, and I'll deal with them all. At a, fundament, at a basic level, you can use a, a twin coil tank and use the solar directly in that twin coil tank to heat water. So it's a very limited hybrid between the ground source and the solar, but it's a perfectly legitimate thing to do and dependent on the amount of solar panel you can afford fit on your property or fit on the building, uh, it can be, uh, on the amount of domestic hot water particularly you need, it can be a very good approach. However, much more interestingly as a ground loop designer, what happens if you use relatively small amounts of solar panels and put them directly onto the ground loop? And that's something that we model regularly. And because my background is in modeling heating and cooling buildings, it's actually relatively straightforward to extend that to modeling solar thermal. So we can look at the solar collection at a given uh, latitude with a given angle and shading and everything else you see on like the EST's website, the Carbon Trust website for how much solar energy you're gonna collect with your panel. And you can feed that into the design software in a very similar way that you would feed in a cooling load. It's not identical, there are some changes because you don't have the compressor energy in the heat pump now to consider, but it's a very analogous pro process. What you can do with that is at the two extreme ends, at one end, you can say, I'm going to put in the ground loop I was going to anyway, and the solar energy is going to warm up the ground, so I'm going to get more efficiency out of the system. I've got a warmer source now. Or at the other end, I can say, I'm going to cut my loop down and save some installation cost, 
keep my efficiency, keep my water temperatures as I was before, but I'm gonna rely on the solar energy to keep that temperature up throughout the year. In reality, of course, good engineering sits somewhere in the middle. So you take a little bit of installation benefit and you get a little bit of uh, in, uh, benefit in terms of efficiency improvements. The additional benefit you get when you look at solar PVT and ground source is that you're effectively cooling that panel in a more effective way perhaps than you would do if you were heating domestic hot water from that solar thermal back panel. And therefore the front panel, the, the PV element of it, becomes more efficient because they work more efficiently at lower temperatures. So there's an additional benefit to looking at solar thermal and solar PVT uh, as, as, a, as, a different, uh, as a different technology. Um, I think that's probably where I'd leave it for that. It's probably sort of middle of the second week in the ground loop design course, that one. Uh, but, uh, you know, a very interesting topic and one that gets me quite excited because I'm sad. Um, yeah, I, 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 think, I think the other thing to, to add to that particular set of answers, Chris, is that uh, everybody's experience in that particular aspect of uh, ground loop design in the UK is currently throttled because under the renewable heat incentive, you can't get uh, benefits for solar thermal if you use it for anything other than hot water. And there was also a problem with the concept that solar energy put back down a borehole wasn't naturally occurring. So there were some dreadful misunderstandings about the technology right at the outset of the renewable heat incentive, which has effectively prevented uh, many installations of this type and people taking this sort of benefit, I think that's a very, which was a shame. Very fair point, Bean. And, and, you know, I'm just fresh off a call with Bayes uh, representing the heat pump industry, ground source heat pump industry, actually, uh, in the consultations that are currently underway. And one of the key refrains that I was on about uh, was please, please do not put us in a situation again where we're perverting the engineering to suit the grants in the policy environment. Uh, so a very, very important point being, um, uh, yeah, let's leave it at that for now because again, yep. it's another hobby we've got, horse. We've got, we've got more, Chris, they're, they're, they're loving it. Um, so Peter, uh, Peter says, what off the shelf design tools are suitable for use in the UK? He says he's aware of EED. Yeah, EED, GlePro, GLD are all available. I personally use GLD by Gaia Geothermal um, through familiarity uh, and training experience and so on. They're all excellent packages. What I would say is the slight alarm bell rung when you said off the shelf. Yes, they are available off the shelf, but please get trained uh, for two reasons. First of all, all of them look very unfriendly when you first open them up. Uh, so just to get to know what you can and can't mess around with. And secondly, if you get it wrong in terms of, for example, in GLD, if you mess around too much with the flow rate on the ground loop, you can get all sorts of answers out of it. So just uh, be aware that it's worthwhile getting some training, either from somebody like myself or the other consultant, in, uh, consultant members in the Ground Source Heat Pump Association, or from the, the manufacturers, if you do, or the software manufacturers, I should say, if you do opt for the software manufacturers, bear in mind that the packages are not necessarily UK centric in terms of how they are built. So GLD, for example, is very North American focused and you've got to be able to filter out some of the stuff that's in there and apply it to the UK market. Um, okay, so uh, Peter then followed that up uh, with a, a supplementary which which I'm assuming that these software tools might pick up. So he says, does the presence of upper steel casing in a borehole, uh, say 15 meters to stabilize drift deposits, if left in place, influence active meterage that should be, uh, that you should assume that the borehole's delivering? So there's, there's sort of two questions I think there, Chris, that you might comment on. It's, first of all, would that have an impact? But secondly, actually, should you be leaving steel casing in place in a closed loop environment anyway? Ideally, you wouldn't uh, uh, leave a casing in place, partly from a cost point of view, but from the embodied energy and that steel casing is, is high. You don't want to be just throwing it away. Uh, and it does have an impact in the 
transmissivity between the borehole and the ground. But fortunately, because steel is such a uh, such a hot, much more conductive material than anything else involved other than the water inside the borehole, uh, it's a positive rather than negative benefit. But absolutely, you really shouldn't be leaving casing in the ground. Unfortunately, it is inevitable. Sometimes it gets stuck and that's just the way it is. But dealing with the ground is far from a precise science. Okay, super. And then um, I, I guess it's one of the sort of big questions which I think will be uh, will be will be will have been tackled by the time we get to the end of the fourth um, the fourth uh, event. But Richard Richard says, uh, just in case you can't make it to the others, uh, he says, if you have a location where sufficient groundwater is present, and I'm assuming he's saying, and also where you've got the space, would would you recommend open or closed loop? Okay. Um, I'll just, to be ecumenical, <laughs> I will just say that the opinion is divided in the industry. And I'll give you my personal opinion, but I'll also try and reflect the opinions of others as well. Uh, so there are member companies of the Ground Source Heat Pump Association who specialise in doing open loop boreholes for domestic systems. And they are very good at that, and they are very good at making the economics work. They tend to do that by working in a geographically uh, small area. It's actually quite large, but a geographically specific area where they can install water wells at a relatively low cost and where the licensing is not going to be too much of an issue as far as the environment agency is concerned. When you start getting into commercial systems, you're always or almost always going to be above the 20 meters cubed a day limit, at which point you will need an environment agency license. Now that has an overhead associated with it. And the overhead to get that license is many tens of thousands of pounds. So I did some work on sensitivity analysis a few years ago. And as a rule of thumb, and I, I do not treat this as hard and fast, but as a rule of thumb, I tend to think that projects below 250-ish kilowatts you're probably better to stick to closed loop boreholes and above 250-ish kilowatts, open loop really comes into its own. Now, I'm not saying that you should definitely go down open loop bigger than 250 kilowatts. My personal feeling is if you can't do closed loop because of the long-term maintenance and lack of interface with the environment agency, if you can't do closed loop and make it stack up financially, then that should be plan A. But uh, open loop becomes a very significant and indeed less costly plan B above 250-ish kilowatts. <laughs> Others in the industry will give you different opinions, particularly ones who come from a water well background, who will say that open loop is much more universally applicable. Is that fair? Uh, yeah, I think that's a fair. I think that's a fair. I think that's a fair summary, Chris. Um, but one of the other factors to take into account. Uh, once you're above the 20 cube a day uh, licensing threshold is the uh, risk appetite from the consumer because uh, the licenses are timed and whilst it's unlikely that you would have a license withdrawn at the date when you need to go to be relicensed there is a risk you know clearly because it's got a time bomb on it um, there is a risk so uh, I think that that has to also be taken into uh, into consideration. Uh, and I would um, so again tying neatly into. Uh, can I just also mention being yep. that in my mind there that um, there are different aquifers in the UK. Some of them are incredibly low risk in terms of getting the yield of water that you need out of them. Some of them are higher risk, and that needs to be a careful mm. part of the risk assessment being was talking about. Mm. So the, the sort of uh, addenda to that conversation, Chris, from, uh, from Alex, uh, Alex Driver, um, uh, he says that I mentioned space for open loops. Really, actually, I was thinking about space for closed, but he's quite right because he then says, how far apart should your extraction and discharge wells be in an open loop scenario? Okay, the, the rule of thumb is 100 metres. But that's a very blunt rule of thumb, frankly. Um, if you've got a smaller system or you've got opportunities to put in some horizontal separation, uh, uh, sorry, vertical separation as well as horizontal separation, and if you're really good at your hydrogeology and your modelling, 
using finite element analysis and all of that, you can certainly get away with shorter spacings than 100 meters. It does depend on the type of aquifer you've got involved. Uh, just to get off topic slightly, there are two types of aquifer uh, that are generally characterized. Fissure flow aquifer, which is where the water sits in cracks in the ground, and intergranular flow aquifer, where the water actually sits in the rock. Imagine dipping a pumice stone in a bath of water, that kind of thing. And they have got very different uh, hydrogeological consider considerations and characteristics. So if you're going to be looking at both an open loop scheme, first of all, I'd say get somebody involved. I use specialists to back me up and I've been doing it for 20 years. Um, and when you get into the detail of the hydrogeology, get a specialist involved and they'll be able to advise you. But if you know nothing else and you're an early days of a project, 100 meters and you should be okay. Um, and then the, uh, there's another follow-up on the same, uh, going down the same th uh, thread, which is really good. I, li I like the way these discussions um, bring, uh, bring more, more topics to the fore. So uh, Gulkan is back and he says, following up on the open loop discussion, what's the durability of open loop systems in comparison to closed loop systems? Okay, again, it depends on the aquifer. And a large part of that is the minerality of the water that's involved. Uh, you, in many cases, in some cases, have to have quite extensive maintenance regimes to avoid clogging of recharge boreholes uh, with mineral deposition. Uh, you can have a maintenance regime required for heat exchanger replacement or uh, remediation. That could be as, as short as six months. More commonly, it's 10 years, but it can happen. So depending on the aquifer, you can have very significant maintenance requirements for open loop. If the cost uplift to go to closed loop, and on larger projects, there is almost always is a cost lift to go to a closed loop from open loop. If that's manageable, then longer term, it's a more survivable asset and requires less maintenance. Mm -hmm. So what I would encourage you to do is look at the techno-economic analysis over the lifetime of the project and put in real uh, sensible maintenance regimes for both closed and open loop and take it in the round and assess it from that point of view. But as, as, a, as a principle, closed loop needs very little maintenance. Open loop will almost always require some maintenance. Okay. From um, Dan. What are your thoughts on shared ground arrays and the loads per dwelling and how that affects the overall design? Um, okay, that's a really good question. So I probably design more shared arrays for social housing than anything else. Um, it's a very interesting topic. I'm very lucky with my customers in that I get excellent load information from actual site surveys on existing systems and proper heat loss calculations on new build systems. So I'm very confident in the loads. I get peak loads and I get monthly profiles. So I'm very confident in those load profiles. We then break those systems up into arrays as much by hydraulic consideration as anything. So if we can only fit 110 mil pipe up a riser, that tells us how many heat pumps we can connect to that and how many arrays we then need to break that up with. So there's a hydraulic consideration as to how much you break that array up. And those hydraulic considerations have got real strong cost considerations as well. If you go from 125 mil pipe to 250 mil pipe, your costs go up disproportionately because you can't manually handle anything above 125 mil safely. So you've got lots of considerations there. From the point of view of the core of your question, it, can we take an, an amount of diversity? Absolutely, we can take an amount of diversity in shared array systems. Obviously, the more properties we've got connected to that single array, the more we can take diversity, and the less properties we've got connected to that array, the less we, have, we can take diversity. Now, again, it's probably deepened now to the third week of the ground loop design course. Uh, but we have functions in GLD and the other commercially available design software where we can actually take a view on diversity and take a sensible, um, take a sensible amount of it. 
and there's a number of different ways we can do that. We very rarely chop the peak load down as you would do in a, domestic, uh, in a conventional district heating system, for example, but we'll very often adjust the amount of hours the software is, is assuming all the heat pumps will run together up. So uh, again, quite, a, quite an advanced piece of ground loop design that, uh, and uh, a very interesting one. <clears throat> Brilliant, uh, thanks Chris. Um, and uh, uh, in the absence of any more from our, from our punters, I've got a couple of questions which I thought you might like to address. Uh, the first is, um, what about double probing? Okay, uh, the, the design software I use allows a, ma a huge amount of flexibility in terms of what is in each borehole. We can connect boreholes in series, we can connect you know, double probes in boreholes, we can do all sorts. Um, there are, again, drilling contractors and member drilling contractors out there and member installers who are very keen on double probes. I tend to let the economics talk and I tend to find that the uplift in cost is outweighed by the increased benefit in terms of thermal output. You've got a lot of pipe in quite uh, close proximity in a small borehole with two U-tubes in it. And there are circumstances in which a very good thing to do, for example, you've got a very tight site, but the increase in capacity, output capacity, is relatively modest, to put a number on it, 10 to 20% maybe, but your uplifting cost to actually install two U-tubes in a borehole, it often outweighs that. So I often, I often investigate it, but I very rarely end up specifying it. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. And then my my last point, and I think this is uh, as relevant because of your um, comparison with the way that you work and the MCS lookup tables, regardless of whether anyone is looking the, using the lookup tables or not, should the starting point always be a thermogeological report from a resource that knows what they're doing? And that could be the British Geological Survey, it could be any number of um, uh, private um, hydrogeological uh, resources, but even if you're using the lookup tables, you've got to know, you've got to get the data from somewhere. I, I think there is a, an enormous amount of scale actually in the installer companies uh, and in drilling companies in terms of understanding geology. Uh, so I think let's not decry that first of all as a resource and, and many companies are well placed to work on geological considerations themselves. Uh, I do think however that if you've got limited experience in geology or if you're concerned, uh, I'll mention you know Lincolnshire, Bista, think very carefully before you put a drill rig in those parts of the world because you can get a spout of water 60 meters in the air and that will make you lose sleep at night. Um, so just be very careful about the geological hazards I touched on earlier. John will talk about those in the third in the series of talks in quite some depth. He's got a tremendous amount of experience uh, in that regard. So there's a geological hazards element of it. So if you are in any way concerned, a report from the BGS will highlight those problems. And the others in the marketplace who do sell uh, geological reports will also highlight those concerns. And they will also give you uh, an assessment of conductivity that goes beyond just looking at the BGS website and assuming that the rock that it says on the surface goes as deep as you're drilling. Because in most parts of the country, we're actually going through several layers of strata before we get to depth. Some of those layers of strata may have higher conductivities than others. Some will have different diffusivities. There may be moving groundwater in some of those layers of strata. There may be separate aquifers actually separated, and it would actually be frowned upon to connect those two aquifers together. So there's a number of considerations in there. What I would say is get help if you don't feel 100% confident in what you're doing. And there are resources out there from the BPS and from member companies who will be able to help you. If you're a consultant engineer looking at projects, many consultancies like myself will have a look at it, probably won't even charge you to have a look at uh, a system initially, just to give you an idea about what's likely to happen and what problems and opportunities you've got. Uh, we would then go on to charge for some more detailed advice, but most will certainly have a look at it uh, for you. So you've got a, a range of options there being 
uh, to answer your question. Oh, well, that, that, that's good. It's perfectly, perfectly valid. I just wanted to stimulate the, uh, the discussion, Chris. Um, uh, okay. Oh, actually, it's most of them coming in. If everyone's happy to go on, Chris, you're not going anywhere, are you? I'm good for um, time. So, Gulkan, Gulkan is back with us. Uh, is this, which one is worse? oversizing or undersizing in terms of lifetime and operational concerns for the boreholes are bivalent or monovalent systems more common um most of what i do is heat pump only uh, the vast majority of what i do uh, in commercial buildings we will very often include because cooling loads dominate we'll be very often looking at using dry air coolers to supplement the ground loop and the trick there again this is middle of week two on ground, ground loop design course uh, is to add some dry air coolers to the ground loop itself and then run those at night to precondition the loop for next day's option um, bivalent systems are perfectly legitimate but do it not because it says so in the textbook you know you do 60 percent of the peak load and you do an 80 percent of the hours that's a rubbish rule of thumb. Do it because you've actually looked at the loads and it makes sense. So don't just do it because you think it's the right thing to do. So the whole discussion on monovalent bivalent systems is a very interesting one. And there are very good reasons why you do it both ways. One of the best reasons to do a heat pump only system is because you're not interfacing a heat pump with a boiler circuit, which is fraught with difficulty. It can be done. I'm not saying it can't be done, but you need to know what you're doing and you need to get your controls absolutely right on it. So back to the first part of the question, what's better, undersizing or oversizing? Um, most installations will be, uh, to some extent, oversized because there will be some assumptions which naturally you've got to be on the cautious side of. So the thermal conductivity of a ground when you've not got the benefit of a physical test is something that you should naturally be a little bit conservative about. So most systems should be slightly oversized. The impact of that, because modern pumping is so good, and because if you do it properly, as Robin will talk about next week, the pressure drops on these systems should be so small, you're not really costing yourself any more energy if you've got an oversized system in terms of pumping, which is, might be your concern, and you will get an efficiency benefit from the ground source heat pump having a slightly warmer source. That might be a small benefit and it might actually never pay back the additional investment for that additional ground loop you're putting in, or it may pay back in the very long term, but it's a system that's gonna be reliable and robust. When we model systems, one of the things we do is graph it over the 20 years MCS design life. And you see the thing getting cold on the winter and warmer in the summer. And we're looking for the bottom of that dip to plateau nicely out at, uh, at the 20 year mark at the zero degrees C. But we don't want it continuing down colder. If you've got an undersized system, it will start to dip below the zero within that, that 20 year design life. So in theory, if everything behaves as it should do, if the uh, building is consuming as much heat as it should do and the boreholes are working to the capacity that they should be, then you've actually got an MCS non-compliance in year four, six, eight, whatever. Uh, so in balance, you're better to be oversizing slightly. And as I say, when I first started getting into the industry, the consumption of circulation pumps, we were actually tight against the 3% of the thermal output um, maximum that's stated in MCS. So your pumping energy has got to be less than 3% of your thermal output to your system, sorry, 4% your thermal output to your system. Actually with the modern generation, particularly like Gromfus pumps, we're below 1% very easily. So the pumping energy is a lot less significant than it once was, but Robin will show you some horror stories on that next week. Brilliant, very good. Uh, Chris, thank you very much indeed. Pleasure being. Okay, so we're uh, we're at um, we're, we're, we're heading towards three o'clock. Um, there are no more questions coming in. Um, perhaps last call if anybody's got anything uh, burning issues that they'd like to bring up. Uh, otherwise, there will be opportunities, obviously, to raise questions in the subsequent uh, events in this four-week series. Um, so uh, doesn't look as if we've got anything else coming in. I think probably we'll call it a call it a wrap there, Chris. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank you.
you very much indeed. That was fascinating. And I think the, the quality of the discussion that we have with our, uh, our participants, our delegates, if you like, is, is really good. So I thank you all very much for attending. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next week when we will be returning, I think, Chris, back to our one, usual one o'clock slot. Yes, we will. Yeah. Thank you very um, much indeed, everybody. Next week and uh, all subsequent will be, uh, will be one o'clock. Okay. Thank you very much indeed, everybody.